uh, previous lecture on the extra pulmonary manifestations of sarcoidosis. And as a dermatologist and dermatologist, it will be mainly on the cutaneous uh, manifestations or uh, cutaneous or skin involvement in sarcoidosis. Um, so this is the outline I'm going to go through. Now, I know that the dermatology terminology may be a little bit uh, specific to, to dermatologists, but I'm going to be a little bit basic in terms of uh, specifying the lesions that I'm going to go through. So uh, I'm going to go through a brief introduction on the frequencies that usually occur in, uh, in the skin in association with systemic sarcoid. Uh, I will go through the cutaneous lesions in sarcoidosis, the things that are usually common and that can be indicative of, uh, of systemic involvement, as well as of just limitation to the skin. Uh, and this will, of course, include both specific lesions and non-specific. And we'll, I, I, will, I will explain the differences as I go through the lecture. Of course, we'll go through the workup that is usually indicated after you diagnose cutaneous sarcoid. Uh, and, of course, the prognosis of cutaneous sarcoid as is. And, uh, of course, the treatment that is specific to cutaneous sarcoid, of course, the rest of the treatment as systemic sarcoidosis, I think the next lecture will address this. And, uh, finally, I'll just brief you uh, on some of the results uh, on a study, actually, that I have been running over the past year on the cases of cutaneous sarcoidosis that we have done over, let's say, the, the last 18 years at the American University of Beirut. So just a brief introduction, uh, this you already know, uh, all of you actually, uh, it is a systemic disorder as we know of sarcoidosis. Uh, it's the pathognomonic thing is actually the non-caseating granulomas uh, that we see and this is just a, a graphic diagram of these uh, granulomas. Um, of course, it can involve any organ and specifically also the skin is, is very commonly involved. Uh, uh, and, of course, it can affect uh, all ages, all races, uh, and both genders. Uh, now, in the skin sarcoidosis or the cutaneous sarcoidosis is more common usually in females. Um, now, concerning cutaneous sarcoidosis in general, uh, the skin involvement in sarcoidosis occurs in around one-third of patients. Now, this is in general. For example, in the pediatric population, it's actually much more than that. It, it reaches up to e even 70 or 80 percent. But this is a, the general frequency among the uh, all ages. Uh, now, why it's important to know about the skin lesions and sarcoidosis that occur in association with sarcoidosis? Because it can be simply the first manifestation of the disease. And the, mo the, other, the other important thing is that it's an easy site that's accessible, that can be, you can get sa sampling from that site easily and make the diagnosis. So this will prevent delay in making diagnosis of sarcoidosis if it is systemic from the beginning. So uh, moving to the lesions that we typically see in sarcoidosis. Uh, now, of course, there are, uh, usually the classification is among specific versus non-specific lesions. And of course, when we say specific lesions, by definition, you should have granulomas on pathology. Uh, of course, non-specific lesions do not have granulomas, and they can occur with other disorders. So the, uh, among the lesions that you can see that are specific, actually, you have the, mo the, the most characteristic, if you want, the lupus pernu, and we'll show pictures later on. Uh, you can have macules, papules, and I'll explain them later on, uh, just uh, the basics, the terminology. You can have subcutaneous nodules. You can have infiltration of scars. This is very common. Uh, you can have plaques. And less commonly, you can have rarer presentation in, 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 in uh, presentations that can mimic psoriasis. You can have ulcers. You can mimic even ichthyosiform disorders, which are usually genetic disorders. Uh, and of course, you can have hypopigmentation. Among the non-specific, of course, the most common is erythema nodosum. And the less common, uh, non-specific lesions are usually calcifications or clubbing of nails, even erythema multiforme, although this is controversial. But some people classify it among the non-specific lesions of sarcoid. So starting with these specific lesions, now of course any of the specific lesions, clinically, if you press a slide, this is what we call dioscopy, actually, you will get the apple jelly appearance. Uh, and this is usually not really specific for sarcoid, but it is usually an indication that this is actually a granulomatous disorder. This could be cutaneous TB also. Uh, 
But this is usually indicative that it can be a granulomatous disorder, and then you biopsy it, and you get the, what we call the naked granulomas that are characteristic of sarcoidosis. So let's start with the different lesions that we may see in sarcoidosis. Of course, the papules are the most common lesion, and by definition, papules are just elevated lesions in the skin that are less than uh, half a centimeter. Uh, and these can be of different colors. You can have orange, you can have yellow or brownish, uh, red or violaceous. And in sarcoid papules, classically, if whether they either spontaneously resolve or if they resolve on treatment, uh, they resolve without scarring. And this is uh, unlike plaques, for example, which we'll see later on, which resolve with, with scarring. And these are examples. Usually, papules tend to involve the head and neck area most commonly. Uh, and specifically the periorbital region. And here it can be uh, a few lesions and it can be actually extensive all over the body. Uh, plaques, this is again, this is another presentation. Uh, and it could be the main lesion that you see clinically. Uh, of course, plaques, unlike papules, they are also elevated lesions, uh, but they are bigger in size. So they can reach more than one centimeter and they, be, they can be up to five or even 10 centimeters in size. Now, usually the diameter is much greater than the elevation of the lesion, but in general, it's an elevated lesion. So these plaques can assume different morphologies when we look at them clinically. You can have something like this, extensive over the body, uh, which can look even like psoriasis at times. You can have some annular, which is oval or circular in shape lesions that can also mimic other disorders in the skin. You can here have involvement of the neck as well. This can even look like uh, a fungal infection of the skin. And of course, uh, in addition to having like uh, red or erythematous uh, lesions, you can also get some hypopigmentation in plaques and as well in other different types of lesions, and we'll see later on. Uh, moving to lupus pernio, it's actually a specific variant of the plaque lesion of sarcoidosis. Uh, it is the most characteristic lesion in sarcoidosis, uh, and it commonly occurs in black women. Uh, it's, it's, uh, this is the highest frequency. And it typically involves the central face, so mainly the nose. You can ha also have involvement of the cheeks and the lips, as well as the ears. Uh, and it can actually be deep enough to involve the nasal bone and the mucosal surfaces as well. Now, it's important to recognize this variant because it has been highly associated with, involved, with systemic involvement in general, mainly pulmonary fibrosis and bone cysts. And in general, if we treat as dermatologists, this usually has a prolonged course uh, of treatment and it does not respond easily to treatment. Another type of lesion that we see, which is also under, if you want, the plaque uh, lesion, is angiolupoid lesions. And uh, these, some actually classify them uh, as lupus pernio, although they are a little bit different. In addition to the papules and the plaques that we see on the skin, which can also involve the central face, you, you see telangiectasias, which are actually dilated vessels. And this is usually not present in lupus pernio. And uh, also, unlike lupus pernio, it's a little bit less extensive than lupus pernio. And it has also been associated with systemic involvement in general, mainly pulmonary involvement. Uh, moving to scar sarcoidosis. Now, of course, this is well known about sarcoidosis that any type of scar on the skin can get infiltrated with time. It can get bumpy. Uh, and uh, and at, at times, it's spontaneously resolved, but at times, you need to treat it topically with steroids. Uh, any type of scar can, be, uh, can get involved with sarcoidosis, including from surgeries, from trauma, from... Uh, uh, putting in uh, foreign materials such as tattoos or silica. So all of these can be involved with sarcoidosis. However, the involvement is usually asymptomatic, so no itching, no anything. It's just the, uh, the scar suddenly gets uh, elevated. And uh, of course, this is usually benign and it spontaneously resolves. Now, uh, there has been some controversy whether this is usually associated with systemic disease or not. Some studies have said that it's more commonly associated with systemic disease. However, other studies have uh, contraindicated this finding. Uh, now, the rarer forms of cutaneous sarcoidosis, the specific lesions, you have the psoriasiform sarcoid. If you look at this clinically, you will say, well, this is sarcoid. I do not need anything. I, I do not need to do anything else. You, would, you will not even biopsy the patient. But if you dig more into the history and you look 
more carefully, you will find that most of these lesions resolve with scarring, which is not the case of psoriasis. So actually, this is atypical, and then you biopsy and you find that this patient has sarcoidosis, actually. Uh, so this is very rare, actually. Uh, maybe one in thousand or something like that. So it's very rare, and it usually involves the legs, as is the uh, as the image here shows, of uh, again usually darker skin individuals. So this is papules, plaques. Moving to nodules. Nodules are bigger lesions, so usually more than one centimeter, and they are usually deeper in the skin. As you can see from this image, you can see these lesions that are skin colored here, and. Uh, so you, they are not usually erythematous. They are not red or violaceous. They are skin colored. And as you can see from the histological picture here, the involvement, the granulomas, are present actually in the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, and that's why it's called subcutaneous sarcoidosis. So there is no involvement of the overlying dermis or epidermis. And of course, this is a very rare form of cutaneous sarcoid. And unlike the other, most of the other lesions of cutaneous sarcoidosis, it's more common in Caucasians than in blacks. Um, now, clinically, of course, you may think these are lipomas, so just like uh, benign fat tumors. However, if they are, they tend to be chronic or they change in size or they, uh, they uh, resolve on their own, you have maybe to biopsy such patients and to look for other diagnoses such as sarcoidosis. This is one actually of the largest series in the, liter on the, in the literature on subcutaneous sarcoidosis. Uh, it actually included 16 patients. This is a very, rare, a very rare manifestation. Actually, it showed that the peak incidence is in the fourth decade, like the usual case of sarcoidosis in general, with female predisposition, typically involving the upper extremities rather than the lower extremities. And uh, it tends to occur with clustering, meaning you have multiple lesions in one area, such as a forearm, rather than being bilateral or involving the arm and the forearm and the hands altogether. So you tend to get clustering of lesions in one area. And more importantly, this is almost always associated with systemic disease, and most commonly pulmonary. So out of the 16 patients present in this series, actually, all of them had pulmonary involvement with less involvement of the other systems. Now, of course, as is the case usually with the, with the systemic treatment with corticosteroids, usually these patients respond well to systemic corticosteroids. Hypopigmentation as a manifestation of sarcoidosis, it is, uh, again, not really that common. It can occur in papules or in nodules that we already spoke about, and it can be just a macule, which is just a discoloration of the skin without even elevation or depression, as is the case here. And as you would expect, because of the change in the contrast, it's more common in blacks. And uh, as we said, uh, in general, it tends to involve any type of lesion. So by definition, this is not a lesion, but a change in color. Of course, you can have other lesions. You can have ulceration. This is not really uh, very common. You can see it, in, uh, again, in uh, usually the black race uh, and mostly in women as well. And ulceration is when you get actually loss of some of the layers in the skin, such as loss of the epidermis and the dermis here. Um, and of course, the ulcer can occur de novo, meaning you do not have any preceding lesion in the area, or it can occur in a plaque or a papule or a nodule. Um, and this is here, as you can see, involvement of the lower extremity. This actually brings up a big differential, and you can, have, you can have many things to think of, and it's actually only the biopsy that can help differentiate between uh, the differential that you may have in mind. Ichthyosiform, it's when you have scales. Scales are actually just dead cells on the, on the skin, uh, and ichthyosiform disorders are actually genetic disorders that we see usually at an early age. So this actually sarcoidosis causing ichthyosiform changes is an acquired type of ichthyosis rather than actually a genetic type. This is very uncommon and it's more importantly, the, the only thing important about it to recognize or to remember is that it's very commonly, like subcutaneous sarcoidosis, very commonly associated with systemic disease. And again, uh, as you can see here, this scaliness over the trunk, again, this is not really very specific. The differential is big. The biopsy will, will help make the diagnosis. And here you can have involvement of the extremities as well. Erythroderma is it's a very rare uh, presentation of sarcoid. Erythroderma, by definition, is just redness of almost the whole skin. Uh, and this can occur with psoriasis, with, with uh, lymphomas in the skin. Sarcoid as the cause of erythroderma is very rare. I have never seen a case, but it has been reported in the literature. Uh, 
Now, in addition to the skin, you can have involvement of the skin appendages. So you can have involvement of hair, you can have involvement of nails, and you can have also involvement of mucosal surfaces as well. So uh, uh, alopecia, uh, it is a rare manifestation of sarcoidosis, but whenever sarcoid plaques or uh, different types of lesions affect the scalp, you can get actually different types of alopecias of, or of hair loss. You can get scarring or even non-scarring. So here the image is actually scarring alopecia, and here you can get even total loss of the hair. So uh, this is actually a rare manifestation, but it can occur, and it's commonly very, it's very commonly associated with systemic disease. So you have to look for systemic disease in such patients. Uh, nail involvement, it's again a very rare manifestation, but you can see it, and usually we see it with swelling and redness involving the finger. Uh, so what we call dactylitis. And it's also very commonly seen in patients who have lupus pernio. So whenever you get lupus pernio, check the nails. Uh, uh, so uh, the, the presentation usually in, in the nail dystrophy that you may get can be nail thickening, can be discoloration, longitudinal ridging. You can have uh, separation of the nail plate from the nail bed, what we call onycholysis. You can have depressions or pits in the, in the nail plate and you can have some brittleness in the nails. But again, the differential here is big. You can have onychomycosis, fungal infection of the nail, you can have psoriasis on the differential. So here again, biopsy will make the, 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 the diagnosis. Mucosal involvement is another rare manifestation. You, the oral mucosa is usually more involved than other areas. Uh, nasal, of course, mucosa can be involved, as is the case of the anogenital mucosa. And here, Caucasians are more commonly affected rather than the black race. And in the oral uh, cavity, usually it's the buccal mucosa that's commonly affected. Here, of course, I'm showing lesions involving the palate. Uh, so this is concerning the specific lesions, where you get the granulomas uh, if you biopsy those lesions. Of course, you have the non-specific lesions, which some believe to be more common even than the non-specific. Specifically, what I'm showing here. So these are nodules, erythematous nodules, on the lower extremities. Usually it occurs on the shins, on the anterior surface of the legs. And this is, of course, erythema nodosum. Now, of course, we know the causes of erythema nodosum are broad, very broad, from infections to inflammatory conditions to neoplastic conditions. So again, here, it's actually the whole picture the patient is presenting with that makes the diagnosis. Uh, so this is the most common nonspecific lesion that occurs in sarcoid, and it can occur in 3 to 25% of patients with sarcoidosis, with systemic sarcoid. Uh, and it's seen more commonly in Caucasians. Now, of course, erythema nodosum commonly occurs as uh, a criterion in the diagnosis of Lofgren syndrome, so acute sarcoidosis. Uh, of course, with the association uh, associ associated with bilateral hiral adenopathy with arthralgias and fever. Now, remember that also we have another syndrome with not really cutaneous manifestation, but you can have swelling of areas uh, in the face, which are mainly the parotid gland involvement and with other manifestation which makes you think at times of sarcoidosis. So this is con concerning the cutaneous, uh, the specific lesions that we see and the non-specific lesions that we see in sarcoidosis. What's the prognosis? So of course the prognosis, there hasn't been really much of studies to talk about the prognosis of cutaneous sarco sarcoidosis at, as it is. It's mainly how much systemic involvement you have in association with it that makes the prognosis favorable or unfavorable. Um, but as it is, if you have just limited cutaneous sarcoid, it's not really known. Even if it's actually extensive cutaneous involvement, it doesn't mean much in terms of how much or the extent of the systemic involvement. Uh, now, of course, the importance of knowing the cutaneous or the skin involvement in sarcoidosis, keeping it in mind, is that it allows early diagnosis. And thus, it may be good in terms of making the diagnosis early and thus preventing, starting treatment early and preventing the complications of sarcoidosis in the other uh, internal organs. Of course, I'm not going to talk about this. This has already been done. Uh, concerning the systemic workup that is usually initiated after you make the diagnosis of cutaneous sarcoid from the respiratory workup uh, and uh, the rest. Uh, I'll go directly to the treatment, just uh, a little bit on treatment uh, that's specific to the skin. Now, we know we can use a lot of systemic treatment when we have systemic sarcoid, such as systemic steroids, methotrexate, or antimalarials. Uh, but in case of cutaneous involvement only, without systemic involvement, we usually go with uh, uh, topical or intralesional steroids. Um, 
Now, if it's more extensive, if it's actually uh, involving uh, big areas on the skin, you may then jump to systemic treatment. Or if it's actually localized, but the patient is not responding to local treatment. Now, of course, keep in mind, if you have only like few lesions on the skin and it's not really disfiguring the patient, it's not in an area that's apparent and the patient doesn't really uh, care about treating it, you may go without treating it. At times, these lesions actually resolve on their own. Um, so this is concerning the treatment and uh, moving actually to the, to the study that we ran over the past year on cutaneous sarcoid. Now, of course, we looked into clinical and histopathological features. I'm going only to pass on the clinical features that are of interest to us. Um, so actually, over an 18-year period, we had uh, diagnosed about 76 cases of cutaneous sarcoidosis based, of course, on the clinical and the histopathological features. Now, you know that even when you have on histology the classical naked granulomas, you have to rule out other things that can present similar to sarcoid, for example, Crohn's disease and others. So here the diagnosis Dr. Abbas, was based you on... You still have two minutes. Yes. So the diagnosis here was based on the clinical pathologic correlation. Uh, and this, these were mainly the inclusion criteria. Uh, so we looked into the clinical and the histopathological features of these 76 cases. So just to show you some of the results. Concerning the gender, uh, it was more common in females, as is expected. Uh, mean age around 47 years, and the most common uh, cutaneous lesion that we had actually was plaques, so 49%, almost half of the patients. Uh, of course, you had also papules, nodules. Lupus pernia was present in 13% of the cases, scar sarcoidosis in 7%, and subcutaneous sarcoid was present actually in only 5%, so four cases. Now, of course, many patients had more than one morphology, so papules and plaques, etc. Uh, the most common location affected was the head and neck area, so in 50% of the cases, followed by the extremities and the trunk. And finally, concerning symptoms, it was mostly asymptomatic because it was mainly in the dermis and without really involvement of nerves. Importantly to you, actually, is the extracutaneous. Based on the cutaneous involvement, how many of these patients had systemic? Actually, uh, only 30% had systemic involvement in, in the 76 uh, cases studied. And the most commonly affected site, as we would expect, is, was actually the, uh, the uh, pulmonary system, so the chest, and then followed by the eye involvement, and the rest, as you can see. Now, six patients out of those 22 patients had actually presented initially with the cutaneous lesions, and then systemic workup revealed the systemic sarcoid. So this is the importance of knowing actually the skin lesions. And the rest actually had already been diagnosed with sarcoid and then presented with the skin lesions uh, out of the 22 patients. Uh, of course, uh, I would like to acknowledge before I finalize uh, Dr. Reem Ishaq, she's actually the chief resident uh, at the Department of Dermatology who had actually worked hard on the study and also the co-investigator, Dr. Abdul Ghani Kibbi. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Abbas, for this uh, very interesting